Hello, my name is Ricky. Welcome back for another military video reaction. Love doing these. This one is a bit special. We're going to go back to uh, World War II and uh, a footage of a tank battle caught on film. This is from the channel Battle Guide. If you want to check out the channel Battle Guide and this video we're going to watch, you find both links in the description go there and give them the support that they so much deserve i'm very intrigued for this one it's going to be a 20 minute long video and i have no clue what how the footage is going to be how it's going to look but i'm super keen on watching it before we watch it we thank the awesome people of recce channel members and the patreon thank you so much for the incredible support a big shout out to the supreme tier donators over by patreon and channel membership thank you so much thank you personal shout outs to the ultimate supporters deja walt roni Dwayne, tammy kevin dana and troy thank you so much that list is getting mighty long and i love that thank you so much for that oh Please be really good, please be really good. On the 6th of March 1945, American tanks from the famous 3rd Armored Division fought their way into the heart of the German city of Cologne. Desperately trying to repel the American advance and hold the vital bridge over the River Rhine were the last few tanks of the once formidable 106th Panzer Brigade. What followed was a unique chapter in the Second World War, captured in real time by combat cameramen on the ground. In this video, we'll use the latest technology and wartime footage to follow the epic action that is today known as the Cologne Tank Duel. Yes! So we got Panther versus Pershing. By March 1945, the Western Front looked something like this, with the Germans being pushed back towards the mighty Rhine all along the front, including just here. How can I miss this channel? Battle Guide? Oh my days, I already feel like the commentary and the video graphics is like super top notch. In Cologne, shattered by Allied bombers, it was a shadow of its former self, but nevertheless, as Germany's fourth largest city, still represented an important Allied objective. Let's wind the clock back to 1945 and blend the wartime aerial over the modern satellite image to see the city as it was then. One key location is the impressive Cologne Cathedral, which even today dominates the metropolitan city centre. And conveniently for us, Whoa. serves as both an orientation point and the American objective in the fight. It was in the shadow of this cathedral that the famous tank duel would take place. But to get there, we need to move westwards and back in time a little. By early March, US forces of the legendary Spearhead Division found themselves here on the outskirts of Cologne, having fought non-stop since Normandy. Leading the advance into the city were the tanks of Colonel Leander Doan's Task Force X, some 45 in total, but in this video we'll follow just two. This Sherman 76, commanded by 26-year-old Wisconsin native Lieutenant Carl Kellner, and Eagle 7, a brand new Pershing tank commanded by Sergeant Bob Early. The Pershing in particular. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's not mentioning the others. <laughs> we need to mention them. Uh, tank commander in Sherman 76 was Carl Kellner. Gunner was John Gialuca. Assistant gunner were Curtis Spear. Driver Julian Patrick. Assistant driver was Oliver Griffin. And the other one, Eagle 7, was tank commander Robert Early. Gunner Clarence Moyer. Assistant gunner John Derigi. Driver William McVeigh. Assistant driver Homer Davis. A brand new Pershing tank commanded by Sergeant Bob Early. The Pershing in particular was important, weighing 46 tons with 100 millimeters of frontal armor and a powerful 90 millimeter gun. The, the five man tank was a big step up from the far more common Sherman, albeit a largely untested one in action. All that would soon. I, I'm going to say this I, I, everyone knows about Sherman. The Pershing is fairly new to me. Change. But just why is this action unique in Second World War history? Well, it's thanks to these guys, a group of journalists, photographers and combat cameramen who were embedded within the leading elements as they advanced, meticulously capturing still images and footage along the way. Foremost amongst them was Staff Sergeant Jimmy Bates, Leon Rosenman and Fred Ramage, 
who, armed only with cameras, ran all the same risks as their armoured comrades. So what exactly were the Americans facing? In truth, it's hard to be precise. It was a chaotic time for the German army. But we do know that remnants of the badly mauled 363rd Volksgrenadier Division were emplaced in the area. We also know that at least three German tanks from Panzer Brigade 106 were in the vicinity on the far side of the rail bridge and were to be thrown into the fight last minute in an attempt to stem the advancing American tide. The plan of attack was something like this. Units would push in on each flank of the city, sealing off any escape north or south, whilst at the same time a central column led by the tank. I'm hanging on to every word. Oh my days. Tanks of E and F companies of the 32nd Armoured Regiment would attack from the northwest, driving into the heart of the city to capture the cathedral and hopefully the vital Hohenzollern Bridge over the Rhine. Our route in this video will follow this central advance. Let's get straight down to the ground, to the village of Pulheim, to pick up the story. We know that the Americans were here thanks to at least a few landmarks still standing in the area, which can be traced today. It was here at about 10am on the 5th of March that cameraman Jim Bates captured footage of the American column advancing down this road. At this time, all the tanks of Task Force X were advancing down the same route and met little resistance until they reached Cologne suburbs. It was here that the infantry came into their own. Advancing with the armour, their role was to clear houses along their route of advance. It was a tough job, requiring GIs on the ground with plenty of guts to be first in the door. By mid-afternoon on the 5th of March, the wider part of the Venloa Strasse, a road leading directly to the city centre, was reached. This exact location we can identify on film today as it allows us a unique opportunity to follow these leading tanks. Here we see that Early's Eagle 7 is firing towards the old cemetery as they continue to clear a path eastwards. By the end of the day, the westernmost suburbs were cleared and those famous twin spires of the cathedral were finally in sight, albeit some way off. It's likely that US forces held here for the night, regrouping and rearming for the much sterner test that was to follow. On the other side of the city, the Germans too were preparing. Late in the evening, a Panzer Mark IV arrived from southwest Germany at the eastern bank of the Rhine. After a hellish journey under continual air attack, 18-year-old gunner Gustav Schaefer was glad just to be alive, only to learn that the following morning he was to advance directly into Cologne. Let's take a moment to understand the situation on the morning of the 6th of March. It's likely at this time that the single group split and took two separate but parallel routes into the city. One, a group of four Shermans, led by Eagle 7, taking the Subelrater Strasse, and a second group, including Kellner's 76 and a 75mm armed Sherman, continuing along the Venloa Strasse. The aim being for both groups to converge on the square in which the cathedral stood. It seems that the camera team split too, with Jim Bates and Leon Rosamann following the group led by Early's Pershing, and another team including Clarence Garrell and Fred Ramage following the pair of Shermans along the second route. Only a few roads apart, the tanks would remain in radio contact throughout. Let's return to young Gustav Schaefer. Shortly before 10am, he recalled receiving the order to advance and describes what happened next. We drove three tanks right over the Hohenzollern bridge into the city. Once there, two tanks were immediately directed to the central station. When we had crossed the bridge and the other two drove to the central station, an officer told us to drive further into the city. We then ran further westwards, passing the cathedral until we came to an intersection. Now we know that by 10am on the 6th, at least three tanks, a Mark IV and likely two Panthers, advanced into the ruins of Cologne. Commanding one of the Panthers that day was Oberleutnant Wilhelm Bartelbohr, an experienced tank commander holding the Iron Cross 1st and 2nd class. He was to take up position, as per orders, of course unknown to the advancing Americans, in a tunnel just northeast of the cathedral. Returning now though to the Pershing Group, accompanied by cameraman Bates, they also advanced directly towards the Mark IV, commanded by Oberfeldwebel Rolf Militzer, with Schaefer at the gun site. The nerves were incredible on both sides. As the Again, I want to push out this uh, impeccable graphics, description, everything. 
it's truly one of the best documentary I've seen with this detailed description of everything that goes around. I really do enjoy this. I really enjoy this. Let me know. Just said, Recky, I am too enjoying this. Let me know. Two tanks cautiously close distance, slowly feeling their way through the rubble-filled streets. A civilian vehicle, driven by a local grocer, Michael Delling, with his employee, 27-year-old Katerina Esser, in the passenger seat, came racing into view, apparently trying to escape the approaching firefight in the almost deserted city. They unknowingly drove straight between Early's and Militzer's tanks, with tragic results. No! Tense with nerves and unsure who occupied the car, both Clarence Smoyer, the gunner in the Pershing, and Schaefer in the Mark IV opened up. Riddled by machine gun fire, the Opal slew to a stop, with Delling dead at the wheel, and young Katerina Esser mortally wounded beside him. As is often the case in the fog of war, civilians find themselves caught in the crossfire. Everyone else in Cologne that day would have been shaken by an enormous explosion moments later as the Hohenzollern rail bridge, the last possible lifeline for the German armour in Cologne, was blown up by German pioneers. There was now no way out. It would be a fight to the end. With each tank now alerted to the presence of the other by tracer fire, Smoyer caught sight of the Mark IV as it hastily reversed behind a building. Now out of sight, but its location known, Smoyer decided on a new course of action and repeatedly slammed armor-piercing rounds into the five-story building directly in front of the enemy tank. The resulting debris which collapsed onto the panzer blocked its turret from rotating. Surrounded, outgunned and demoralized by the blowing of the bridge and the damage to their tank, Sergeant Militzer and Gustav Schaefer had finally had enough. They exited the tank running down this road and into a side street before taking shelter in a nearby hotel basement. Apparently determined to fight on, the remaining three crews stayed in the damaged tank and from here disappear from the pages of history. With the path now clear, the Pershing cautiously began to advance towards the cathedral with infantry and camera team in tow. By shortly after midday, we've left the left advance at least clear for some distance with the Pershing leading of firing as it moved. On the right though, things were so far were looking quieter. Both Kellners and the accompanying Sherman, working as a pair, had reached about this point, identifiable clearly today by the remains of this Roman tower. By matching our on the ground view with the footage of that day, we can see the same point and the way in which the tanks advanced. All seemed to go well until emerging onto this street, just a few hundred meters from the foot of the cathedral, a series of destroyed buildings blocked any further advance. Watching on with his camera in hand was Clarence Garrell and British photographer Fred Ramage. Having called in a specialist Sherman bulldozer to clear the route, the crews were waiting, with Garrell slightly to the left rear of the second Sherman. Garrell now pointed his camera directly down the street at a darker area amongst the rubble. He wasn't to know it, but hidden here in the railway tunnel was Bartelbort's Panther. Seconds later, a 75mm armour-piercing shell slammed into the gun shield of Kellner's Sherman, tearing through its armour and probably killing driver Julian Patrick and assistant gunner Curtis Spear outright. About seven seconds later, a second shell hit the Sherman, and as Garrell continued to film, Lieutenant Kellner and Corporal John Gialuca emerged from the smoking turret with Kellner's left leg clearly having been lost in the explosion. Gravely wounded, Kellner made it just a few yards behind the tank before collapsing. Tragically, he would die a short time later and is today buried in his hometown of Sheboygan, Wisconsin. He was just 26 years old. Shocked by what they'd seen and unaware of the enemy tank's location, the crew of the 2nd Sherman began to reverse to cover behind a rubble pile when it too was hit this time in the right track by the concealed panther. With its crew abandoning, though powerfully, rather than fleeing the area, several crew members ran to the aid of Kellner, the moment being captured by Fred Ramage's photograph, which later appeared in Life magazine. In the space of less than a minute, two Shermans had been knocked out by an unseen foe and three men had lost their lives. But where exactly was this enemy tank? 
Today we know from a letter written by Bartelborth himself that the panther had taken up position beneath this bridge close to the railway station and it was from here that they had spotted and hit the two Shermans. Taking the distance from the known points and the visibility along the street, which by the way is much wider today than it was in 1945, we can calculate that the shots were fired from this exact location at a distance of some 340 meters. We know from Clarence Smoyer that a few minutes later, F Company's commander contacted the commander of E Company, who in turn contacted Early, informing him of what had happened and asking him to go down and take out that tank. Now aware of the very present danger somewhere along his route of advance, Early decided to get a better look from something like safety before risking his tank. Entering this building through these lower windows, he climbed the stairway to a mezzanine along with Jim Bates. In the meantime, the panther had finally broken cover and moved forward some 100 meters to take up a new position right here. Covering three lines of approach to the cathedral, to the left, center, and right, it could command the area, but was also now far more exposed. Electing to face its strong frontal armor directly forwards towards the knocked out Shermans, Bartleborth seems at that time to have been unaware that the powerful Pershing was actually much closer and off to his right. Let's take a moment to understand the situation at this critical time. So Bates and his camera, along with Early, have climbed one set of stairs to get a view out of a window on the end of this building. The Pershing, minus its commander for the moment, is stationary here and a few meters to the rear and filming up the street is Rosenman. The panther itself, facing towards the two knocked out Shermans, is approximately here. It was just after 2pm when Bates, photographer Jim Hines and Early reached this window and standing well back into the room to avoid being seen, spotted the panther side on some 120 metres away. Wow, my... Bates later recalled his conversation with Early. He told me to stay there and he would come back in his tank and try to put the German tank out of commission and I could photograph it. He had one of the new M26 Pershings with a 90mm gun. Sergeant Early said he would turn into the square under me, stop and fire at the German tank. Returning to Eagle 7 and briefing the crew as to what they should expect, they fired up the 500 horsepower Ford V8 and began to advance. Smoyer? A well-trusted member of the crew had been told not to wait for an order, but to fire as soon as he got a shot, hoping at this range that the Pershing's powerful gun would knock out the Panther with a single shot. Inside the Panther, Bartleborth, faced with three possible routes of advance, made a decision, ordering his gunner to traverse to the right, possibly having heard the engine of the approaching Pershing. Life and death for both crews was now down to a matter of only milliseconds. As the range closed and the Pershing cleared the corner building, Bates, having moved up one floor to get a better view and with Rosenman in the street, began to roll. Hesitation was the deciding factor. As Bartleborth and his gunner peered through the dust at the first signs of the emerging Pershing, he reportedly called, don't shoot. Knowing that Schaefer's Mark IV was in the same vicinity and apparently not recognizing the silhouette of the Pershing, hitherto unseen on the battlefield, he believed it may have been one of his own tanks. By the time he realized his mistake, it was too late. The Pershing had cleared the corner and without stopping, slammed around from only 110 meters directly into the side of the Panther. Jolted by the explosion and likely in fear for his own safety, Bates had ducked at the moment of firing and missed the first impact but Rosenman to the rear filmed the Pershing's shot. Bates rose again, just a few seconds later, capturing the second round smashing into the Panther's side armor and kept filming as smoke began to billow out. Oh Knowing my. that further rounds were surely coming, Bartleborth was already abandoning his tank, with his crew following after. The famous Cologne tank duel was over. But what became of this crew, captured on film as they fled their burning tank? A detailed look at Bates' 16 second film clip slowed down and stabilized when combined with the outstanding work of German historian Dirk Lubke allows us to try and piece together the sequence of events. The first clear frames in the Bates sequence show the turret cupola hatch opened and a crewman, presumably Bartleborth himself, standing up. We also see the impact hole of the first shell on the Panther's side. 
For the next four seconds, the tank commander struggles to roll onto the panther's front deck before dropping to the ground. The next frames show the tank commander running for cover and the radio operator still emerging from his hatch at the front right of the tank and also diving off the front deck. As he disappears, the gunner begins to emerge from the same cupola hatch which the commander exited. Finally, the driver emerges from his hatch at the front left, about the same time as Smoyer's second round strikes the tank, very likely killing the gunner who is yet to exit. Over the total sequence, we see four of the five-man crew in view, with surviving records suggesting that Bartleborth, Driver Koenig and one other man were later taken prisoner. A fourth unknown man died of his wounds after escaping the tank and a fifth was likely killed in action. Bates' footage is truly powerful. It was then and it is now. Yeah. A snapshot of a moment in time which affected all of those concerned for the rest of their lives. Clarence Smoyer was no different. He reflected years later. I never went to that tank and looked inside, but they told me all of the crew perished there. I thought about it many, many times. When we were firing, I don't remember seeing them getting out. It always did bother me that they all had to die. I'm happy that some of them did survive. Very happy. Immediately following those actions, the Pershing reversed, stopping outside this building some 100 metres away. Leaving their position in the upstairs window, Bates and Rosenman emerged onto the street to join them. It was here that this famous scene was captured, showing the crew of Eagle 7, no doubt simply glad to be alive. The battle for Cologne was over. Bob Early, Clarence Smoyer and the men of 3rd Armoured eventually went home as did Gustav Schaefer, Wilhelm Bartelborth. Many of their comrades didn't. Smoyer himself never forgot that day at the cathedral and returned several times after the war to visit the spot from where he fired those famous shots. On one trip in 2013, he met Gustav Schaefer, whom he had last seen through his gun sight 68 years before. They got on well and left as friends. So that brings us to the end of this short video. We hope you enjoyed it and want to send special thanks to Dirk Lubka, whose research into this subject has been vital in piecing this incredible action together. <clears throat> I never know. <clears throat> I never know how the videos is going to be. I never know the research behind it. Uh... I am completely speechless about this one. This was, without a doubt, one of the best performed WW2 World War II documentary on one particular thing. I never heard about the, the tank battle in, uh, in Cologne. I loved every second of this 19 minutes and 35 seconds long video. I loved everything with it. I'm going to think about this for a very long time. It was, without a, doubt, without a doubt, the best I ever seen. It's so powerful. It's gut-wrenching. You're on edge. The sacrifice. It gets you thinking, doesn't it? I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for watching. If you do enjoy the content, smack the like, and of course hit that subscribe. And thank you so much for watching. I'm Ricky. You stay safe.